Imagine a scenario in which human longevity exceeds 900 years, where enigmatic entities called Nephilim shared the world with men and colossal creatures, such as Leviathan, who dominated the seas. In this distant period, human society experienced an existence so unique that the vision of the heavens and earth defied modern understanding, displaying a beauty and complexity incomprehensible today. This was a planet where giants coexisted with human beings, meanwhile evil spread voraciously, infiltrating every heart and mind. An atmosphere permeated with violence and corruption permeated everyday life. This was the pre-flood world, a period shrouded in mystery, fascination, and divine warnings that echo through the centuries to this day. In today's video, I invite you to join me on this journey into the past, where we explore the enigmas and hidden truths behind the pre-flood world. We will discover how this ancient chapter of humanity continues to speak to us, leaving us with profound reflections on human nature and its interactions with forces beyond our understanding. It is important to highlight that not all the information shown in this video is taken from the Bible, as it does not provide us with detailed details of this period, making it necessary to look for extra-biblical information, which has a degree of reliability. To understand the pre-flood world, it is crucial to begin with creation. God created the universe, the earth, and all living beings. Adam and Eve were the first human beings and lived in the Garden of Eden, a place of beauty and harmony. However, after disobeying God's order, But thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Genesis 2 verse 17, When they disobeyed they were expelled from the garden and life on earth changed drastically. Adam and Eve had children, they formed a large family starting with Cain and Abel. Humanity multiplied, but also inherited original sin, leading to a world increasingly distant from the purity of Eden. The generations that followed carried both the blessings and the consequences of their ancestors' failures, setting the stage for the pre-flood world we will explore. In those ancient times, the earth had a very different configuration from the one we know today. The biblical narrative describes a large river that divided into four branches, irrigating the soil before it even experienced rain. Steam rose from the earth, moistening the soil and creating a lush and fertile environment, full of vegetation and fauna. The biodiversity that prevailed during this period was vast and intriguing, with countless species of animals and plants, some of which were perhaps unknown to us. There is conjecture that even creatures that we now consider extinct, such as dinosaurs, could have shared this ancestral scenario. A fascinating perspective, isn't it? Society at that time was organized differently, with people dedicated to raising animals, agriculture, and even building cities. However, unfortunately, the path taken by this civilization diverged from divine principles, with harmful practices such as lies, theft, and conflicts between individuals, causing God's disapproval. The lives of the inhabitants of this ancient world were extraordinarily long, with some individuals reaching hundreds of years, such as the remarkable Methuselah, who lived for over 900 years. Biblical scholars offer several interpretations for the longevity of that era, suggesting that the pure environment and less susceptible to disease could be a determining factor. However, it is crucial to highlight that the drastic reduction in life expectancy, limited to 120 years, was a divine response to growing human evil. God, observing the widespread corruption on earth, decided to impose this limit as a measure in the face of humanity's moral deterioration. Then said the Lord, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh, but his days will be 120 years. Genesis 6 verse 3 Thus, the decrease in longevity was not just a natural phenomenon, but a divine decision given the decadent moral conditions of the time. Now, we enter a truly intriguing part of the Nephilim narrative. The Bible does not speak in detail about these beings, but scholars present us with three distinct interpretations about these enigmatic beings. 1. Fallen Angels and Human Women This interpretation suggests that the sons of God were fallen angels who descended to earth, mating with human women and generating the Nephilim. The basis for this view lies in the literalness of the term sons of God, understood as celestial entities. 2. Tyrannical Kings or Rulers Another approach argues that the sons of God were human kings or leaders who, because of their power, took wives of their choice. From this perspective, the Nephilim would not necessarily be giants in physical stature, but in influence or power. This interpretation sees the passage as a critique of tyranny and abuse of power. 
3. Descendants of Seth and Cain Here, the sons of God are seen as the godly descendants of Seth, while the daughters of men would be the descendants of Cain. The theory proposes that the union between these lineages resulted in the Nephilim, leading to the moral degradation that culminated in the flood. This approach seeks a more humanized reading of the passage, highlighting the events and the human lineages described in Genesis. Highlighting that these are human theories. The Nephilim were described as extraordinarily large and strong, appearing as giants in people's imaginations. Some speculation suggests a possible connection between the Nephilim and figures such as Goliath, mentioned in Numbers 13.33. The account, in which spies sent by Israel to explore the land of Canaan mentioned seeing Nephilim, is used to describe the size and strength of the Nephilim. Inhabitants of the region Although there are debates and differing interpretations, there is no clear consensus among biblical scholars regarding a direct link between the Nephilim and giants like Goliath. While Goliath shares some characteristics with the Nephilim, such as size and strength, there is no direct biblical evidence that identifies him as one of them. This is an open area of interpretation, adding a layer of mystery to the narrative. Leviathan, a divine creation, personifies an indomitable and dangerous force. The term Leviathan derives from meanings such as coiling and turning, connecting to the image of a sea creature, although some scholars suggest alternative interpretations, such as a crocodile or even a sea monster. Its presence in the Bible is remarkable, appearing in different contexts and taking different forms. In the book of Job, Leviathan is described as a colossal sea beast, whose scales look almost like impenetrable armor. In other passages, Leviathan symbolizes the devil himself, and, believe it or not, the narrative attributes to him the ability to breathe fire. The inevitable question arises, why would God create such a formidable creature? One possibility is that Leviathan serves as a testimony to immense divine power. It highlights God's sovereignty over such a monstrous creature, reinforcing humanity's dependence on divinity. In the Psalms, Leviathan is portrayed as a creature that plays in the seas, possibly enjoying the vastness of the oceans created by God. On the other hand, in Isaiah he is described as a sea dragon destined to face divine punishment. The question about the presence of Leviathan in the pre-flood world is answered by considering the uniqueness of that period. A world full of extraordinary beings, such as the Nephilim, forged an environment where Leviathan, with his grandeur and strength, found his place among wonders and horrors. This universe eventually became corrupted to the point that God deemed it necessary to start over with the flood. Therefore, when finding references to Leviathan in the Bible, it is crucial to understand that it transcends the mere description of a monster. Leviathan is a testament to divine power, creativity, and, yes, God's judgment, an element that echoes through the pages of Scripture as a constant reminder of the Creator's grandeur and sovereignty. The pre-flood world was in trouble, with people ignoring God's instructions and taking paths of wickedness, engaging in acts such as lying, stealing, and violence against one another. This wave of evil saddened the heart of God, who observed humanity moving away from his principles. Imagine a world where doing good will become scarce. Faced with this reality, God, in his duality of love and justice, recognized the need for drastic intervention. Faced with the persistence of evil and the reluctance of people to change their ways, God made a serious decision. Thus, he chose to send a great flood, a rain that would last 40 days and 40 nights, as a means of purifying the earth of all accumulated evil. However, God, in his infinite mercy, granted people the opportunity to save themselves. He chose Noah, a just and upright man, to build an ark. This ark would be a refuge for Noah, his family, and a pair of each animal species, allowing them to survive the impending catastrophe. Noah's Ark became the means by which God decided to reset the world, eliminating evil and offering humanity a new chance. This decision was not made lightly, as God would prefer people to choose the path of goodness for themselves. However, given the extent of corruption, the flood became the only way to restore righteousness on earth. Thus, the waters of the flood came, radically transforming the scenario, but also marking the beginning of a new chapter for the world. The flood not only cleansed the earth of evil, but opened an opportunity for humanity to begin anew, with the hope of following paths of righteousness and obedience to divine principles. More different than many think, the pre-flood period was a period of great development for humanity. 
The development of the antediluvian world, as narrated in scripture, is remarkable and reveals a society that experienced significant advances. Unlike some extra-biblical theories that may suggest continuous biological evolution, the Bible presents God's creation of man as a rational and morally capable being from the beginning in Genesis 1. This biblical emphasis indicates that, although man has evolved intellectually by acquiring knowledge and developing technologies, the biblical perspective does not support an evolutionary process as a species, as proposed by some scientific theses. The biblical account of the antediluvian period highlights human development. Cain, the first man to be born on earth, demonstrated a degree of development by building a city. His descendants, such as Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal-Cain, contributed significantly to antediluvian society. He learned to live in tents, raise herds of cattle, develop arts using musical instruments and forge tools through working with copper and iron Genesis 4.17-22. In Noah's time, the biblical narrative shows that he had the capacity and resources necessary to build the great ark in accordance with divine instructions. Although the Bible does not provide exhaustive details about this period, it is clear that the antediluvian world experienced remarkable technological and cultural development. This biblical perspective contributes to a more holistic understanding of human development, recognizing not only the material aspect, but also the intellectual and moral aspects throughout this period. How long did the antediluvian period last? This is a question that often permeates our minds, and the answer is not explicitly provided in Scripture. Although the book of Genesis does not provide a precise chronology for this period, it is clear that the time between Adam and the flood was significantly longer than the period after the flood to the present day. It is essential to recognize that several attempts to date the antediluvian period have been made, but all have been unsuccessful. The only record that offers any chronological data is the genealogical list present in Genesis 5. However, establishing exact dates from this record is impossible, as this is neither its purpose nor the purpose of any biblical genealogy. Based on the genealogical list in Genesis 5, scholars can observe that the great development experienced by the antediluvian world may be related to the longevity of people at that time. At that time, there was only one language, and God allowed men to live hundreds of years. This longevity undoubtedly played a crucial role in the technological growth of that period and the effective transmission of information across generations. This perspective highlights the complexity and uniqueness of the antediluvian period, emphasizing that the vastness of time and the specific conditions of the time played an important role in the historical and technological development of this remote period, as recounted in the opening pages of the book of Genesis. And amidst so many doubts and curiosities about the pre-flood world, we can ask ourselves, were men all bad? Was no one trustworthy in this antediluvian period? In the antediluvian period, among the people who inhabited the earth, those who were truly committed to the Lord stood out. We have some examples of people who continued to fear God. We see Abel, the first martyr, remains an example of faith mentioned even in New Testament times in the gallery of heroes of faith, Hebrews 11. We see Enoch, in turn, maintained such an intimate relationship with God that he was translated so as not to experience death, leaving his legacy that it is possible for man to have intimate communion with God even in a totally perverted world. We see the example of Methuselah who lived almost a thousand years in communion with God, and from his lineage came Noah, born and raised in this context. He grew up in the midst of a civilization that, in its final years, was immersed in widespread depravity. However, Noah stood out as a rare exception, maintaining his reverence for the Lord. The Bible reports that, faced with the intolerable situation of depravity, Noah's family was the only one spared when divine patience reached its limit. Thus the antediluvian period came to an end with the outpouring of God's wrath and the destruction of the earth. In the New Testament, the Apostle Peter provides a clear conclusion to this part of the story, by which things the world then perished, being covered with the waters of the flood, 2 Peter 3 verse 20. The flood, therefore, represented not only an act of divine judgment, but also marked the end of this period in human history. Antediluvian history, with its complexities, highlighted both the fallibility of man and the faithfulness of those who remained faithful to the Lord, such as Abel, Enoch, Methuselah, and Noah. Their accounts continue to echo throughout the scriptures as timeless lessons on the importance of faith, obedience, and trust in God, even in the face of the most challenging adversities. And how are we these days? Contemporary reality places us before an inflection point in human behavior, 
resembling, in some aspects, the time of Noah. Corruption has reached unprecedented levels, and society is immersed in a cultural catastrophe reminiscent of the biblical narrative when all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. Cultural confusion has reached such a point that even basic concepts, such as masculine and feminine, right and wrong, have become controversial and defiant topics. The prophet Isaiah warns about the danger of inverting values, when evil is called good and good is called evil, transforming darkness into light and light into darkness, Isaiah 5 verse 20. The rapid pace of change in moral and ethical perceptions has worrying impacts, spreading like a storm not only locally but also globally. At the same time, we live in a time when God has been removed from public life and many resist discussions about him and his law in public debates. The concept of sin, as defined by the Bible, has become misunderstood or ignored with little or no fear of judgment for sin. Any suggestion to this effect is often considered regressive or as hate speech. As we reflect on Noah's time, we realize that God brought destruction to the world due to irrecoverable corruption. However, through Noah, God preserved the human race and other forms of life on earth. God's plan, which combined grace, judgment, and purpose, was manifested in Noah's righteous life, becoming a means of protection and salvation for humanity. The biblical record reminds us that when human depravity reaches an irreversible level, God acts in judgment. The flood is a striking example of this principle. The message is worrying, but it is our responsibility to transmit it, driven by the awareness of a work that, like Noah's, may not be popular or easy. God has entrusted us with this message, and we are commissioned to proclaim it, inviting people to consider a godly response in the face of impending judgment. The story of the flood is intriguing, as the evils committed by pre-flood man echo in modern times, suggesting that contemporary humanity, in its depravity, is close to facing divine judgment. This is a message that, even though it is impactful, must be shared with seriousness and commitment, inviting each individual to reflect on their position in the face of God's judgment. In conclusion, as we explore the pre-flood world, we are confronted with profound and timeless narratives present in Scripture. Accounts of corruption, moral decay, and the need for divine judgment echo through the centuries, resonating in surprising ways with contemporary reality. Just as in Noah's time, we witness a society on the brink of a moral tipping point where corruption reaches alarming proportions. Current challenges reflect an inversion of values, confusion about fundamental concepts, and a growing resistance to divine presence and principles in the public sphere. However, just as God preserved Noah and his family amid antediluvian corruption, the message persists, there is a way of salvation and restoration. The story of the flood is not only a record of judgment, but also a reminder of divine grace that provides an opportunity for redemption. In this critical time, we are called to proclaim the truth, following the example of Noah, facing the unpopularity and challenges that this message can bring. God has entrusted us with the responsibility to share hope and the call to transformation, reminding us that even in the face of human depravity, His grace and plan of salvation remain accessible to all. May we reflect on the lessons of the pre-flood world, recognizing the need for a godly response in the face of impending judgment. May, in the midst of the cultural storm, we find refuge in faith, obedience, and divine love, anticipating a new beginning, just as occurred after the waters of the flood covered the earth. May hope endure, and may the message of grace and transformation resonate amid the challenges of our time.